my aunt was a very artistic, creative person, worked as a draftswoman during World War II at Westinghouse Corporation, and she was my support person in the family. She encouraged my drawing, hung my artwork on her refrigerator, etc. And then she did the opera, the symphony, and art shows in Pittsburgh, and bought some of my artwork later and encouraged me. And that was a wonderful, wonderful blessing in my family. Um, my mother would try to draw things, you know, to be encouraging. My father was my dad. I mean, he was my dad. He, he did his thing. Um, so what I ended up doing was readapting the presentation that I had started, and lo and behold, I don't know how, I had saved a picture, which I would not be able to lay hands on now, of me doing ceramic work in the 1970s. Um, you will see the typical look from the 1970s. And I also had a picture of one of my favorite art pieces from high school. And they were significant because it was part of my story. And I sat there amazed because to me, that connection is the God creative energy connection. I have them all the time. I recognize them, I enjoy them, and I laugh when they happen. So that is a little bit of my background and how this presentation came to be. Um, the piece that's in the background here is actually a detail of an art image I created where it was a found object kind of thing that you find somewhere in a garage sale or in someone's house or somebody's throwing it away and I couldn't even tell you where it came from but it was in my Jesus art show that I had up in Minneapolis in December of 2016. Um, one of the images that I submitted and um, is called, Jesus Abandoned Beckons to Us from Behind the Dirty Glass Window. And it kind of caught people off guard as they were going through the door of the gallery. Um, it's a relatively small piece, probably a 16 by 20 most. Um, so with that, let me show you where I was at one time. And how do we click on this? I'm looking for a clicker. <laughs> ah, and there I am. Long hair, wiry glasses, tinted pink, long straight hair, holding my ceramic chandelier. I made everything out of clay. And as you will hear me tell a professor at my seminary, I even made costumes out of clay. I lived in breeds and ate clay. And this is from 1969, wow, we're going way back. And um, I was a ceramicist. I was from the time I touched clay in junior high school. And so, I move on to this little bit of my story. Oops, I'm looking for an arrow here. Sometimes you just hit the, hit the arrow by forward Well, I got, I got an odd, finicky little computer. I don't know if you can see, well, <clears throat> that's okay. Extended life battery. Um, one of the things that came about from using this book over the years, and I bought this at Borders when they were going out of business, and so I like, carried it with me and it just became one of those things that pops out at you. And I read it through, started this slide presentation, and then just kind of went on with my life for four years. And as, as I said, I, I pulled this book out and read it extensively, brought it back. One of the things that they talk about is the creative dilemma. And that is where an artist is wrestling with something. And it can be anything. Uh, for me, it was change of lifestyle, having two little daughters, and not having a ceramic studio anymore. Because you have to have fire, you have to have kilns, you have to have something to heat things up. And these are some of the objects. I made hundreds of objects. I went through phases of pre-Columbian artwork. I put pottery together in sections and made big things. I mean, I did everything. But texture was always important. So this piece stands in my mother's house. It's about three feet tall. It made it through a firing in a kiln, which means lots of heat. And it is held together <laughs> because I would find ways to put things together that they 
would never self-destruct in any phase. I was using water glass, which people used to put in radiators, to uh, stop leaking radiators. And water glass would seal up the silicon in the clay, and I could save something at any stage if I really liked that piece. Um, so I was really a sort of materials junkie. I was a techno freak for ceramics. This is some of the texture. I used to make stamps off of objects and fire them and then use them again. Um, these were cast little penguins and things like they do in greenware shops. I made hundreds of these. I think I got myself in graduate school by going and selling these little objects. Little, my mother still has this collection. So as I was working with the textures and shapes, I realized at some point in my career, and I didn't have a studio anymore for ceramics, that I was going to have to convert my thinking about my love for textures and shapes, and my interest in art, and what I was trying to express in some other way. I ended up with recycled materials. And for any of you who have been downstairs already, you will see a couple of pieces that are made of polystyrene and all kinds of other materials. And this is what I ended up doing, mass, massive amounts. This was a lot of work I did for a show in Seward, Nebraska at Concordia College years ago. Uh, all of these are recycled materials. Polystyrene, this piece is downstairs right now. Other ones are in various places. Sometimes I don't even know where they go. I've given them away or they ended up in the garage. I mean, we don't, I, you know, you, you sort of favor what you, what you really like. But all of those are, there's even broken eggshells in this one. This was one of the first ones I think I did. And I would combine different materials together because I wanted that texture shape. And none of these weigh very much. They're all like polystyrene and very lightweight materials, but I painted them to look like rock or other materials. Um, so I was doing this pretty much all through the 90s. And that was when I moved here to Omaha and I started working and I had the two children. Where are we? Oh, this is where I discovered that I sort of remembered how to put PowerPoint together with some fancy stuff. Um, this is a piece, eventually, that led to furthering the statement. I am still seeking sculptural painted surfaces. This is a more recent piece, and the right hand and the left hand automatically suggested to me a crucifix. It was the packing material around my washer. And for some reason, the washer and dryer came and I grabbed those. I didn't care about the washer and dryer anymore. I made off with the right hand and the left hand. I had a friend of mine, Xerox his hands, and he is an atheist. And he'd say, what are you going to do with my hands? So I said, oh, we'll see. And so then there were ribbon, and this is a box. And inside of that box are parts of an old Bible I found from Hastings, Nebraska, with flowers pressed in it. The piece is about five foot tall, hanging on the wall. Kind of lightweight. I think I had this piece here in Omaha when we did a show down at Culver's in 2010. So, what I came to conclude after all this time was that I could take all the elements of the earth, earth, air, fire, and water, which I use fire and ceramics and use air to dry things, and I think in terms of nature and the earth. And I can create new visions of life and messages of hope like I've done all my life. If I am depressed, which I think runs genetically in my family, they would probably say nowadays, um, I am too dumb to know it because I have always been a busy little creative kid. And I use creativity and connection to, I think, the God creator spirit. I use that when Everything else seems bleak. I can always put things together in my mind, and if I find the right materials, I can always put something together. And it speaks to me. So, any of you artists, writers, people out there, that's the way I think. And, and you may find some kind of commonality in that, which we can certainly talk about here at some point. Um, I don't want to go through too many of these if they get uh,
and say they've started to take up too much time here. Um, this piece is actually one I want to show you because it is downstairs in reproduction form. Um, the original is sold. Uh, the woman who bought it, I, I think she passed, I don't know. It's, it's somewhere out there. Um, it was one of the first times I actually took an old canvas, painted it over, and then glued objects onto it. And that is a round paper plate, styrofoam, polystyrene plate, mashed on to the bird's body. And this is from Hy-Vee when they were serving syrup. It's a little syrup container holder for little syrup containers when they serve pancakes. Now some people recognize this stuff. McDonald's coffee holders are something else I use and people always, you know, they recognize it. People want to recognize it. Um, but this piece was a breakthrough for me because I had never put up next on before. Um, that opened up a venue for me. I tried something different. So these are I'm just going to keep clicking here so you can see these. These are some of the pieces I was doing while I was painting. And I was painting walls. Oops. I was painting walls. Oops. We went through that pretty quickly there. You saw some pieces. There. <laughs> this piece is a 30 by 48. And I don't put sizes on things. I didn't. That's not really aristocracy kind of way of doing it or archival. Uh, I'm not. Hoping these are in museums someday. If they are, fantastic. And if not, I don't care. Um, but this one is in a private collection. And I started playing with stenciling also. So some people recognize, recognize a engine, an automobile engine a gasket in there. And I use little animals that sometimes I, lizards are one of my favorites. And I spray paint over top of those. So this is just an example of where I took this at the time. Um, and these pieces are downstairs. There. That's one of the pieces downstairs. This was the companion piece. They were ducks and geese. Reproduction artwork, fly through somebody's office, turn the opposite way, and I paint them over. In fact, I don't even take them out of the map. I just kind of paint the whole thing over. And then it gives me something to define, some area that I can work in. Sometimes I like to start with something. I know artists that have started with a blank canvas and sat there in front of it. They're not quite connecting for some reason. But I like that definition of the rectangle or something that I have to go on. Like doing alterations and sewing, you know, instead of creating it from scratch, you have something to go with. Um, so these pieces were all done. And at the time, let's get the other one here. That's a textured surface. I call them icons and monoliths. I thought I was putting a large rectangle shape on a post. Just an iconic figure. That's what I thought they were. So remember that because you will see these show up again downstairs and also um, in the video I'll show. This is a photograph that I took. I do photography too. I gather images everywhere. You have an eye as an artist and you use it. This was a red Aurelius that I grew up in Minneapolis and I put a piece of black cardboard in the back of it and the light was coming through and I was shocked at the quality that you can get off of these little cell phones. Amazing, people have used iPhones for entire motion picture films. So here is the statement I pulled from the book, so I thought this might make a nice graphic, if we can get it up here, let's see. There it is. This came from the book. Art is not about copying or rendering. It's about exploring, discovering, and expressing ourselves. Great artists realize through imagination, experimentation, trial and error, discovery, and expression. The battle takes place in the head, the heart, and the hand or the artist and on the canvas. So it is for the poet and the musician. In creating life change, the battle for living, a fully realized life, is fought on the uncharted waters of the exploration and discovery dimensions. I think, um, I found a copy of the book, I think it's Neil, uh, 
Nellie Nell Skell, Skell, and she was a writer in Hollywood, in a man's world. And I think the quote I saw at the end, even last night I pulled out, was, it's not about fame and it's not about money, it's about finding out who you are. Now I'm going to attribute that to her, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but that's been said in many ways all through history. It's about the relationships. That was something I was learning in conflict resolution classes. It's about relationships. So for me, as an artist, I don't do this for fame and money. Um, I do it because I have to, because it keeps me from being depressed. Depression is a big topic now, with all the suicides and the celebrities. But there are people among our own families and communities that suffer with that. I really think creativity is one of those things that I know it's promoted. Oh dear. We didn't plug my computer. We didn't have a reboot here. Do you have a plug for the actual plug plug? Electricity. Electricity. I forgot the fire element here. <laughs> Some form. You got the fire. Salamanders are laughing at me. Um, or this is a sign that I just wing the rest of it without the visuals. Okay. <laughs> Forgive me for that. Well, I'm rebooting here. I will hand this out to you. If you don't want to take one of these, I am not offended in the least. I will put the rest of them downstairs. It gave me a chance to do a little more graphic design. It's a, um, you can just pass this over. Um, it's a copy of the actual pieces from the show and prices and what materials I use. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, promotional stuff. I hardly do it for myself. And this gave me an opportunity. Sorry about that. was state of the art when I bought it, of course. They all are, aren't they? Until they get older. There we go. Is that a little more? We were there. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know if I have the sound up here. We're going to need the sound. combining things, uh, connecting, reconnecting with an earlier interest or passion. I, my passion for ceramics was so intense, and I felt such a loss that I had to replace it in some way. So I had to go back and find ways to express myself in a different way. Um, another reason and purpose for exploration is to expand our sense of what is possible for us. And I think this applies, all of these, 
all of these exploration and discovery um, points that I'm going to show you today are also community builders. When you study conflict resolution, which was my second graduate degree, I just got three graduate degrees. Uh, the first one was in art, and then conflict resolution, and then seminary. So I want to find creative ways to solve conflicts in churches. But community building means that you have to find creative ways to get people to work together. And so I find that the creative process applies to just everything in life. It's not just going into a studio. It's not just making a piece of art. I will show you some other things I do that I think are creative, but they keep me going while I don't have access or can't get something to drive, or I don't have a place to do other art that I want to do. In other words, I'm kind of open-ended on that. I'm saying the whole creativity is important. Whether you're cooking, or you're cleaning, or you're just living your life. And so you have to, you know, you have to find a way to kind of not narrow yourself. Does that make sense? Not box yourself in and say, I'm not an artist because I don't paint or draw or anything. We're all artists. And as this book points out, you're life change artists. Really. You have changed your life and creatively done things, sometimes for survival, and sometimes just because it's the right thing to do. Becoming aware of old emotions and I think that's engaging in this. Um, sometimes when you make art, it's not what you wanted. And sometimes it doesn't look right. And then you wonder, why am I disappointed? Why am I not? I try to find something in it that is new and different. It may not be exactly what I thought would happen when we put two materials together. Um, there's a whole big phase now of doing artwork which has, I think, oil paint and water paint, something mixed together, and it's all flowing. I don't know. It's all over the internet. And it's um, flow art, or whatever they're calling it. And it's basically just combining materials that normally wouldn't. I think there's an old Asian art technique of floating dyes on water and pressing fabric into it. And there's all kinds of techniques over the years of getting two materials that are generally adverse to each other to work together, which is, again, what do you do in mediation? What do you do in conflict resolution? You get two adverse tensions, things that are in tension, to work together. So, if nothing else, I play. I like to call it play with my materials. Um, some of the things that I have done, I'm not sure which slides are coming next year exactly. Um, ah, here it is. This was part of my studio at the seminary. I actually kind of walled off my bedroom, put a um, plastic tent around it so no one could smell me. And I went ahead and I was in discovery phase. And that was generally what I walked into was this floor covered with tarps and drunk claws and paint. And I find that stimulating. Some artists, I mean, personality gets in your if you like it nice and clean, that's great. But me, I was in ceramics. I was covered with mud. I was covered with clay. Um, so that's the way I work. But you can use raw materials for exploration to discern what's meaningful, which things you're attracted to, what colors. You can change your old assumptions. And again, all of these points apply to people and relationships and community building. Discerning what is going on with the art or what you're doing leads to new insights about ourselves and about the world, I think. And you can be focused and you can be evaluative, but not critical of yourself. You're playing. Children aren't critical of what they're doing. They're playing. They're having a great time and they're making discoveries and they're learning. And sometimes when you're discerning, it often sets off a new cycle of exploring and discovering. The word discerning is used in seminary quite a bit, and I had never really used it much. And here are artists, and psychologists, and sociologists writing about it too. Discerning is what we do. We are always discerning, I think, where we are in life. So with that, let me go on here. I'm going to have to keep clicking here. 
Preparation means deliberately engaging in activities that help us break up our usual patterns of thought and feeling and prepare us for creative insight. Um, remember how I said that in one afternoon in high school, I decided I had to give up theater. And that's because the restriction was I couldn't be in theater classes and participate in the class play and I'm even audition for it and be in the art program at the same time. So I chose art. And I did that painting that I showed you. But that didn't really stop me. Later, I found ways to express myself, whether it was photography, playing drums, creating a scenario and chapel service based on becoming an elderly woman who was incapacitated, and uh, looking corporate. So there, I got back to my theatrical. I'm not afraid to change the way I look. These are the other activities that help me break from my usual patterns of thought and feeling. I grow plants. In fact, I am a plant whisperer or rescuer. I will take little, as you see down here, little pieces of dried up philodendrons that my daughter neglected and didn't water, and I rush home with them, like they are little stray cats or dogs, and I regrow those. I get a great sense of satisfaction from that. Also, I watch cooking shows, which is why I put on 23 pounds at least over the winter. I was not gonna let myself get depressed, one should not necessarily eat when you're depressed, but I was watching Lydia's, you know, Italian cooking show. I was watching all the shows. So that is my version of a frittata, which she did. And there is my um, bread pudding, which was the use of bread, because again, recycling, don't let that bread go to waste. I paint lampshades, and I do jewelry work. This is my messy jewelry thing. And I sort of you know, people that live with me, like my kids, are like horrified because they made me watch the quarter show. Um, but I said, no, these are art materials and these are things that I need. So if I see them there, I get visual stimulation. You see, I'm a visual person. Um, it would be the same for hearing music. It would be the same for hearing good poetry or hearing good spoken word. But I like to have my materials lighting out right there so that when I walk past, that is the visual inspiration for me. I said, oh, oh, look at that stone. It looks different today than it did yesterday. Okay? Lampshades. Painting on lampshades. I just, I don't know, I stencil lampshades. I just, you know, but I will do those kinds of things instead of letting myself get into the mood that I, uh, you know, people can get into. Um, and if I don't have a studio available to do big, messy pieces, then I will find other things to do. This is a piece, I will show you this first, and then I'll show you the words. Um, it's a community piece of art by Andrew Riverside Presbyterian Church and Faith Pentecostal Church, who meets in their building after their service. They share a space. And they did it for me for the Jesus Art Show. I took all the materials over. This is a large piece of cardboard. It was probably about six foot by six foot. I scored some big cardboard. And I took it over there. And I put all the paint out, and I said, well, you are already dressed in your Sunday clothes, but, you know, they were all slapping paint around. And then Faith Pentecostal comes in and does the same thing over top of whatever Andrew Riverside did. And this piece is striking on the wall. It's a community effort. It's an exercise I've done with churches before, or groups. Uh, it's been done by many different groups of artists all over the world. I just came up with it, it's sort of a synchronistic kind of thing that if you can get people to quietly walk around and work together, there's community building there. So we did this piece for the Jesus Art Show because it was a representation of what I call the Jesus Art Energy and Creative Spirit moving, the Holy Spirit, if you like. And so preparation is important. You don't want to think you're going to come up with an immediate solution to a problem. And again, apply this to life problems. You don't always come up with a solution for your art piece or your life dilemma. Believe we can be more fulfilled in our lives if we engage in activities that stimulate creative thoughts. There's my motto. And again, this is coming from this book, but I thought it applied so well, I just uh, stole it here. 
engage in some physical or mental activity before considering the problem. I don't always just go and work on art. I might go cook first. I might go plant some plants. I might do something else. I find that if I take my mind off what I'm trying to solve in one area, it helps solve it in another. Engage in some mind-body practice or practices on a regular basis. Some people do yoga, some people do meditation. I meditate while I drive. Now that's frightening for anybody that might want to get in the car with me and ride somewhere, but people have realized I'm multitasking. <laughs> you can listen to the radio while you're driving on a long distance, especially when I was driving back and forth six hours to Minneapolis on some of my breaks. And um, some people use it as an office. You know, they use that time in the car. They listen to audiobooks. But you can engage in another practice, whatever that is, listening to audio going to visit people, doing something else while you're still thinking about that dilemma you have, creative dilemma, life dilemma, whatever it is. And engage in a variety of creative trigger activities. Well, for me, it's the growing of the plants, cooking food, playing the drums, Sometimes I paint on other surfaces. The quote here is, exploring happens by doing, discovery happens by exploring. You have to do stuff and not be afraid to do it. Um, at one point, I painted the hood and trunk of my 94 T-Bird with paint, spray paint, and glued lizards, salamanders, all over it, and put it in the art car show. Uh, Peter Lochran here locally has one. Lots of cities have art car shows and they bring people in that have turned their vehicles into works of art. And um, I drove around in Omaha for quite a while with that car, uh, painted. Uh, I painted a cement floor down in Passageway, retail space. It was supposed to look like a lagoon. And I don't know if you can see that from the slide, but it looks like a watery lagoon. It's no longer there. They painted it gray. So, sometimes I get a chair and I restore chairs. I've given many chairs away. I'll paint a chair based on somebody's personality, reupholster it, and then I got a hold of coffee bean bags because my daughter and her husband are involved in a coffee shop. And we went to the roaster and I don't care about the coffee. I'm like, what are you doing with these bags? You're like, stuffing them into the trunk of her car. I mean, I have hundreds of bags. But, <coughs> This one, <laughs> I've never seen a coffee bean bag since. It says New York on it, actually. I didn't know they make coffee from coffee in New York. It's like the weirdest bag. It's probably a valuable thing. But anyway, that's why I'm done. Coffee to Brazil, that hangs in my house. It's a Brazil coffee bean. And I try to leave the country. It fascinates me that I'm painting on this piece of material, this sisal or burlap that has been in Tanzania, and I'm like, you know, somehow I feel a connection. So that's something else I do on the side. Um, I say on the side. And as I said, I do photography. My daughter, don't tell her this is here. She's a very quiet person, but I like this quote, and I found the picture, and I said, they match. That's a connection. The quote is by Andrew Wyatt, I dream a lot. I do more painting when I'm not painting. It's in the subconscious. And I feel that way about art. I do art in my head all day long. I don't know if any of you think about art all the time. If you're engaged in a project, you think about creative things. But there's something about this image of my daughter sleeping and my grandson about four or five years ago at Christmas time. And they fell asleep. And I just captured that. So I don't know what I'll do with it. But it's a little snippet of something, and it's all here in my clipboard. Now, this is a kind of fun little video. It actually embedded in here. I was so into this PowerPoint thing by the time I was done with it. <laughs> uh, I had to reinstall software. But this is uh, something I just did spontaneously in my studio. You can tell because I'm kind of putting the script together as I, as I speak. And um, 
let me just show you this. And you will see that my little uh, love of course. Can I go back? Ah, can we go back? Can we go back? So we go back. I don't know if you can get back to the Oh, there. Where do I go? I just go with the arrow? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. In case I get that one. Um, down here is the. So, I just can't see. There it is. There it is. Okay. I hope the sound is up enough. My name is Recycle Materials, in my art. Today I'm going to show you the steps that I take to recycle some of the materials that I use. Free objects that you can find in the trash, such as egg cartons and packing material. All made of it's like a cheap pressed cardboard. After I recycle it, transform it, I use it in my art. I've also invited a few of my friends to help show you the steps that I take. Here I am soaking the materials in a sink or tub full of water until they are very soft. the goggles and gloves for some of this fancy stuff. When the forms are dry, I will use spray paints and latex paints to highlight the forms and create shadows and some kind of depth. I then can use these pieces to form various shapes. Presently, I'm working with some theological and liturgical forms. The cross is an example. I also work with just highlighting and painting some of the simple forms. This was half of one of the egg cards.
trying to get the other video. But this piece I no longer have. It's the only picture I have of it, and I dearly miss it. Every once in a while, you make something, and after it's gone, you realize it was inspirational. I like to keep a few pieces around that I like because they're inspirational. I like to look at them and see these. But as I look at this, well, sometimes you wonder, like, did I do that? Where did that come from? So again, that's that exploration and that introspection, I think, that comes of it by studying it. Uh, some pieces I've had for over a year, I will go back and put something in and say, now it's done. I've waited all that time. Now, you have to learn patience. And I always say, I'm here to learn patience, and I'm not it right now, but you know, that's what I'm here to learn is patience. Um, I think you have to choose what you pay attention to, like the authors of the book are saying. You don't want to let others choose it for you. Listen to your own inner voice. We may not really know what we want, but no one else does either. Even if some claim that they do know what you want, we are the only ones who can determine what's true for us. And I think that goes along with religion, faith, and how you perceive other humans. Nobody else really can tell you what it is you should be doing. And I know social media likes to do that, but I'm just saying, because I worked in the field of bullying and anti-human trafficking and that kind of thing, I, I take a lot of the things that are going on as, I, my favorite word is bullying, you know, anybody says, and I said, no, it's just a catch-all for people in the field. Um, but I know artists that are bullies. <laughs> you, know, you can beat people over the head with your artwork, too. Um, I'm going to pass on this review with Wilson Yates, and that's because it'll just be too long. And I will just tell you this. Um, another time. Uh, Wilson was the head of the Arts and Theology program, and I will just tell you briefly, he reviewed my artwork. And when he reviewed it, I made the confession right on video for everyone to see that those icons and monoliths that I had painted in 2004 were crosses. Because Wilson had come up to me in a classroom and said, my dear, you're painting crosses. And I'm thinking, Wilson, that isn't too hard. You make a mark here, and you make a mark here. It's a common thing. I think, you know, <laughs> it's just a universal symbol. But the thing that he points out in there are two interesting points. One, the universal symbol in Western civilization of the cross is so embedded that when I realized I was, I was painting crosses and I'm in seminary, I'm like, oh, this is a whole deal. I've been doing this all along. And they were so obvious to me. In fact, some of them look like downstairs, like there's figures hanging, like crucifixion figures. I'm like, whoa, 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 where did all this come from? It's a subconscious. The artist works from that deep level of some subconscious. And I think if you let yourself just pull and use different elements, things will happen. And here I am at that point, long ago, probably thinking, gee, I wonder, I feel like I called to go, oh, seminary, and I'm like, oh, well, should I? But, and then somehow, at that point, all of these pieces, most of the ones that I brought downstairs were from a show I did at Luther Seminary in St. Paul in 2015. And I called it transformations because I was not only, as I pointed out to Wilson, I was transforming myself. I was starting to realize that theology permeates life. Everything we do is about our existence and our relationship to higher powers. And if that higher power becomes drugs or alcohol, then you deal with that. You, you, you deal with a higher power that may or may not control you or work with you power with you, power over you. It's all like mediation work to me. It's all the same thing. Does that make sense to you? It's all the same kind of spirit. So Wilson, who is very feeble, and was very kind to come. I picked him up and he was on a cane. He had broken his shoulder in St. Louis. He's, he's really ailing. But he came and reviewed my work and pointed out too that the crosses he was attracted to, the ones downstairs, are the ones that are white and sort of illuminating. There's two pieces downstairs. Um, 
And one of them is the Eye of God contemplating salvation piece that is sort of a white cross. And he didn't care about the eye floating in there as much as he did the illuminated cross and the elements that were there. And um, as I said, he was very kind to come there. Now, Wilson and I had a tension by the time I graduated because I found out I was the only person there in the program who had a degree in art and fine arts, and I, I did not, yeah, I did not work, I mean, I was trying to work with them, and there was no working with at that point, and even though I tried all my mediation skills and my, uh, you know, every, I tried everything. Um, the school has had some financial problems, it's had all the things going on, so there was, there was tension there. And so I just went off into my own apartment, like I said, and I made my own stuff, and then when I got evicted out of my housing, which is another funny story, but that's a uh, I went down to the art studio and lived in my art studio in the basement of a church for three, four months until I got a house. And I'm a survivor. I, I found creative ways to get over my, my, you know, my, my, my situations there. And um, Wilson actually did buy a piece of my artwork. He actually paid money for one of my pieces, what was a cross, and has it in his home. So we have this, this mutual kind of respect, kind of interesting relationship. Um, and he really is a notable authority on the history of art in relation to churches and theological implications in art. So I was, I was very blessed that he came and he talked to me in 2015. Um, and yes, he, he is a professor emeritus. These are some of the current projects I'm working on. Uh, this is a large piece. It's polystyrene. I paint on materials that normally artists don't work on. You cannot spray paint floral carbons on polystyrene because it eats holes. I coat it first with latex paint. And if you put latex paint on first, then you can put anything you want over top. I found that out through trial and error and making lots of holes in things. Um, but this is a piece that actually has a three-dimensional quality and it looks like that form is coming off the canvas and it's all flat. Um, I let the fluorocarbons eat into the surface. And I also glued a bone skull of an animal on there. And then of course my daughter, who uh, is rather photogenic, my older daughter, um, she, I, again, I don't have a, uh, a waiver signed, so I was afraid she'd be here this morning and I'd be able to show you all these pieces, because some of them she'd probably go, whoa. Um, that is a Xerox image. I use a lot of Xerox imagery because if I take a photograph and then I blow it up, it looks to me in black and white like a charcoal drawn. And so that's a cut out image of her floating across. Um, these are some of the other pieces. I have a series of women's pieces going through my head since 2008. It is not complete. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was constantly ongoing and working on it. Now, that's another one of my daughter. I turned her into a strange, angelic, yet kind of evil-looking being. This piece uh, hung in a classroom at my seminary until one of the instructors said, please take it down, it's distracting me. And she said, that is a compliment, you know. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, never mind. Like a kind of dual-edged sword there. And, um, I have a piece downstairs. This one is a little spooky, only in that this woman I photographed in a bookstore in St. Paul, which is no longer there, in 2004 when I went to visit. And I was thinking about this woman's series even back then and gathering some photographs. And she, uh, her name is Martia. She has a strand of hair hanging down. And uh, lo and behold, a couple of years later when I was at seminary and working on this piece, which is tiled together, it's Xerox images tiled, and because I did graphic design at one point, I can piece these together and put them in the publisher and get my printer up there to, to do them, and I piece them all back together so you can see where they're all kind of fitted back together. Uh, and then I paint over top of it, and it's kind of like my way of doing, I don't like to draw, I mean I, I, I draw, I, I do sometimes, but I'm not an artist who draws all the time. I like that fast way of getting that image up there, so I Xerox it and then I paint over top of it. Anyway, 
I don't know where Martia is, she doesn't know where I am, and she calls me while I'm working on this piece and said, this is Martia Marcuna. I found you a business card, and I don't know if you remember me, but you photographed me in a bookstore two years back. And again, I go, the mirror goes up on the back of my neck, and it's that God connection moment. And I thought, oh yes, I remember you. I'm looking right at your faces, and your eyeballs are this big. And we got back together struck up a relationship, I keep in touch on occasion, and she is uh, an interesting lady. So that is one of the pieces I included downstairs because it's an indication of what I'm currently kind of mulling around up in here, which is kind of a scary place, but I want to explain that you know, there's projects up here. And this is a full-size figure, which is on a Goodwill canvas. I don't know where I found one that big, but that is my daughter again. I turned her into and uh, this is one she has not seen, but I have warned her that it could show up some point in Omaha. Um, it's hanging in Minneapolis right now, but it is the Horror of Babylon Jezebel piece I did for my New Testament class. And somehow, in my mind, I combined the theory of the Jezebel from the Old Testament with the Horror of Babylon. Because Jezebel was a term used for young black women in the mid-1900s it indicated a kind of disdain for their social status. And I wasn't aware of that until I did some research. So this piece um, is done with bits of paper, gold, spray-painted paper. It was overspray from other projects. I don't throw anything away. If it looks interesting, I keep it around for something else. So I had all these little bits of paper. And if you looked at closely at this piece, it's on the surface. It's all collaged together. And then I spray painted over top of it, and it was kind of my Gustav Klimt kind of, um, you know, era kind of thing where you used a lot of gold, if you're familiar with at all with this work. And the Jezebel aspect was the young black woman from the 30s, 40s, 20s. And then the purple and red is indicative of the paintings that were done of the Horror of Babylon from the Book of Revelation. So, I might get that one down here to Omaha at some point. And then I have pieces that I work on that are self-portraits. And like Jim Don used to do self-portraits all the time. I loved his work. This was my um, 2014 picture of myself. And I was doing it with ink and I was doing it with charcoal and too many all kinds of things and I basically ended up uh, it ran down and I was very sad and I said it looked like tears and it's called tears of loss it was at the point where I decided I could not work with the University of Theology program at the United Theological Seminary and I felt sad in a way but then I wanted to figure out a way I could still survive and overcome um, the obstacles of not having a studio there or other things that were going on and then I have um, series where I was turning myself into different characters from the Old Testament and New Testament. And this was me as the prophet Deborah, looking fierce, with red hair, and it's unfinished. I want a giant black raven above her head, which I haven't quite worked into this yet. So this is the ongoing stuff that I do. So we're getting close to the end here, if you have any questions at all. These are large pieces that are, again, Xerox images tiled together. Um, the one on the left is a three foot by seven foot uh, that I did from Andrew Riverside Presbyterian Church for Easter Sunday a couple of years back. And uh, they wanted to surprise everybody on Easter morning. And I'm sure when they walked in, this was kind of a surprise. Um, so The Sacrifice, which is a photograph I took in the early 90s of a musician here in town named Bart Wolf. And of course, he was lying on the floor at the time, so I turned it up, right? And then we have a piece of pink gauze tacked on the top for the 3D effect, you know, which is kind of unusual. But all of this texture on the sides are cut cardboard, all kind of dug into little religious symbols. And on the right-hand side, there, I don't know if you can see it, are the egg cartons. The tops of the egg cartons redone over, reformed, lining back. And this piece has a little bit of a funny story. It's about four foot by six foot. Um, when I brought this piece of polystyrene in from the alley into my studio, a woman came through the alley in her car 
and wind blew the piece over, and she freaked out and drove over it and kept on going, this young girl, and I came out, and there's a giant tire track across the piece. Anyway, this is a tire track running across the side. And I thought, well, it sort of looks like brick. You know, I kind of left it there, and I stained it, and I painted it in. So there's a tire track running across the Holy Spirit piece on the left side. And then these are blown up so that they were life-size images. Um, I picture the Holy Spirit as sort of a large, female with blondish red hair, I don't know. I mean, this is my imagination, and that could change. I think there's a motherly quality to that. There's sort of a female energy. And it was odd that when I took this picture years ago, my friend Lori, who's a resident here in Omaha, um, it looked like the shadow was like a dark wing in the back of her, on the right-hand side. So again, I like to play with the photography images and a little bit of the technology, too. Kind of interesting to go from ceramics and earthy things to technical things. And so, I think this last slide is my challenge to all of you here. Be daring and make a statement. Do something different. Do something creative. And this is a suggestion for the whole community here. I want to consider doing what I did up in Omaha. Do the Jesus art show. That really gets people going. We, as a white, pretty much European-centric civilization here, I figured out a long time ago that I don't believe Jesus, as a historical figure, was a white man with blue eyes, anything like the Warner Solomon portrait on the left. The famous 1943 portrait of Jesus, very white European. And if you study art history, you'll see how that changed for the masses in Europe. Um, picture of an Asian Jesus, which makes people feel much more comfortable in an Asian religious setting. My submission for one of the shows we did was Wayne. He works in the back of the St. Vincent de Paul store on Lake Street in Minneapolis. He's a community advocate. Everybody knows Wayne. And I asked, would you pose for my Jesus portrait? And he said, what? You want me? You want me? And he stood up proud. And then this was what inspired the show, which was hanging in the church where my art studio was located and the music studios were up on the top floor. This is the Robert Downey Jr. Jesus, and that's what they call it. So. That is my challenge to this church. We did a poetry reading, we had writers come, we had musicians, and we made an entire creative event out of the Jesus art show, including children's art. If you think Jesus and the energy is a big ball of green, blurry energy or something, kids were doing stuff, I had my studio open, and we just did whatever we thought the Jesus energy represented, whether it was photographic imagery. We had black velvet Jesuses. We had glow in the dark. We had people who collected things. We had people who painted, photographed, did abstracts. We had everything. It was simply open for interpretation. So I thank all of you. We're running a couple of minutes later, but um, are there any questions? And I will be downstairs at coffee hour after service. If you have any questions, I'll be down here when the art show is. Um, I'd be happy to answer anything you want to ask. Anybody? I have a question about yes. crosses. Yes. Is, uh, they're, they're throughout, and you mentioned it's a universal symbol. Well, what meaning, and yes, uh, many things are, are uh, inside that we can't explain. But as you've been to theology school and write down some of this and that this Gates said, gosh, you came a lot of crosses. How what does the cross mean personally to you? Um that's an ongoing ongoing thing that I just um at the time that I made the little video about Wilson reviewing my art, which was in 2015, and even now um, I'm kind of laughing about the fact that here I was painting 
the subconscious monolith icons, knowing it was an icon of some kind. Like, what is it? And so, after you get the language of having studied, you know, theology, you can reinterpret it. And I thought, well, here I am with that deep subconscious Christian cross symbolism. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I read the crucified God by Mo Mama, and you get you get all the symbolism. The cross is the symbol, the symbol. And and I was afraid to say anything. I mean, I had been in a different denomination, which was very universally accepting, but maybe not. But you know, Wiccans, pagans, druids, and shamans, and oh, I floated around with all these people. We're all looking for the same thing, folks. We're all looking for that meaning. And so I realized it's another way of interpreting my life and my place where I am now. Um, having transitioned through all of that, and it came out in my heart, I was not afraid to call them crosses anymore. They're not just icons and monoliths, they're crosses. And so I now put the title cross on there. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this may seem odd to some people that never left and then floated around and came back. But I think sometimes that journey is what gives you the perspective. You know, so the cross, yeah, I may run out of crosses, but you know what, you just make, I mean, it's this and it's this. It's endless possibilities, folks. It's interesting to me that Catholics, I mean, the cross is a, I mean, it was a method of execution. And uh, Catholic Church uh, recognized that, I think, more than we often do. We, we do not have Jesus on the cross very often in, in our icon mm -hmm. you know, system. As one of the famous theologians um, who came to the Reimagining Conference in 1991 in Minneapolis for feminist theologians said, who wants to see a dead body, bloody body hanging on a cross? You know, <laughs> that symbol for Moltmann and other theologians historically has been significant. So it, it, it's a matter of what you tolerate and what you, you accept. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a feminist, like my grandmother never shaved her legs and then she wore a bra. You know, I mean, I'm just saying it's in the genes, but I'm not a radical feminist who says, how could you have a God as a father and he's violent and you know, I mean, I don't go there. I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but there's a lot of PTSD in religion and life in general, and you have to figure out, that's again, that emotional response. What does it trigger in you? Does it upset people to see a black Jesus? Well, I mean, when you've grown up looking at that all these years, and little kids, I mean, still, I'm it's just precious to me. Yes, it is precious. precious. I, I really like it. Like you go down a long hallway. Right. There's the Jumbo Jesus, and I just and all the disciples are kind of lined up all right away. And right. Then, right. I just in a church yesterday. I mean, every church in, in Northeast Nebraska has that yeah. one, so it is comforting. It would be comforting. What would happen? It's comforting if you you know whatever they look like you, it's more comforting. Yes. Yeah. And that's what happens with the Asian and the blacks. So, but in historical perspective, in terms of our. Um, recruitment process in the Christian church. This was all people saw in Europe. And because it looked like down here. So as Christianity has expanded into Latin America and the shifting of the hemispheres now and the center for Christianity is going to Africa and other places, that's what they would look at and say, that's our Jesus. So I think, you know, he's a mama ready for Jesus or <laughs> You know, is anybody ever ready? My feeling is art pokes you in the eyes. We did a show once called Art. Art that pokes you in the eyes. It does. It pokes well, you in the eyes. Just the family I grew up in, but Jesus was always a Middle Eastern Jewish, probably dark skinned fellow. But that's that's incredible. But you know, I mean my family didn't talk about that. My dad didn't even go I mean he went to church and sat there and as soon as, as soon as you see Peter, most people, as soon as you see the cross, you can see Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, that's... How could you not? Yeah. yeah how could you not? 
So for me, the whole cross symbolism led me back to my Christian roots. And even though I've been on a journey with other denominations, because I went for the one that said, oh, we're universal and we're open and accepting, and, and, and I figured we're going to cover the big umbrella here, you know? But everything, you know, I mean, it has its day. I, I think there are some denominations that get into corporate structure and, and get into things that marketing and I mean, I've seen atheist agnostic factions come in that are kind of fundamentalists and bang on their Sam Harris and Richard Hopkins, you know, Dr. Hope. I mean, basically, you know, can take over. Again, bullying, bullying other people. So, you know, fundamentalism comes in all packages. I had a friend once who said, you don't know what it's like until you go to seminary with a fundamentalist pagan as your roommate, you know, Wiccan witch pagan. Bring him on our books, you know. I mean, I, I, I mean, this happens with everybody. It happens with anyone about anything. If you're so rigid that you hang on to those judgments and it's dualism, then there's no powering with. There's no powering with people. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're an interesting person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, it's funny because um, I was at a church where they forbid anybody putting anything on, on the community table. And since then, it's like, uh, at the beginning, it'll be a pinch point for me, and then I think, no, uh, it's not just the furniture, it's, you know, uh, and so as you talked about community, I thought it was appropriate that you have your stuff on the community table. Is this a community table? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So like, you know, your community is, <laughs> it's like, okay, this makes sense to me. It is multi-use. I mean, was the first communion table a uh, communion table? No, they didn't even know it was communion. It was just yeah. a big old table to put their food yeah. So, yeah, I mean, people get very, I can reach Symbols are powerful. Yes, how do you balance power of a symbol and right. openness? Right. right. I, mean, I mean, I know people that are Catholic that, I mean, uh, touching their rosaries would be like going up and taking somebody's tribal drum that had juju in it or something. I mean, they would be... It, it's an affront to them. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, symbols have power. Thank you just have to you just have to balance it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much.